And you hear all sorts of horror stories about companies that have got it wrong in the US. And I think it's held to a, a sort of scary position for many, many founders. I think my point is really around if it's your best market, it's your best market. Don't ignore that fact. Anecdotally, from our experience, we spread ourselves quite thin early on in complicated markets to enter like Brazil and Russia and so forth. Now, these might be the best and biggest geographies for food production, but they're also complicated markets to enter. It's about balance. And probably with the resources that you have available, they're not not biting off more than you can handle too early. With Hummingbird, the the technology stack itself is is fairly advanced because you have bioinformatics, remote sensing, machine learning, plant pathology, precision agronomy, image processing, all wrapped up in the same software architecture. So there's a lot of science under the hood. And Getting that right requires money and patience, the right team and time. So the challenge for us, particularly in those early years, but to some extent now, is really around the technical execution. We are trying to alleviate negative climate change in food and agriculture. It's not selling umbrellas through an e-commerce platform. Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to Mission First the podcast to get inspired and to learn from successful entrepreneurs who are building a sustainable future for our planet and its people. I am Gilles Toussaint, your host and the founder of GT Impact, a growth and digital marketing agency working only with companies making a positive difference in this world. Starting and growing a tech company is never easy, especially if you are trying to have a high impact on a global market like the food and agriculture industry. Developing an AI technology is a very fancy and trendy topic, but you can only be successful if you find a real pain point to solve. So how should you best try to find product market fit in such a busy technological and competitive market? How much funding should you raise? How long should you try before you decide to pivot? And once you find product market fit, how should you expand and internationalize? Should you go in an attractive but very expensive market like the US? Well, these are all questions that we are going to answer in today's episode. I'm very excited to receive our guest, Will Wells, the founder and CEO of Hummingbird. Hummingbird is an artificial intelligence SaaS platform that helps food and agriculture business to be more efficient and sustainable. They use drone and satellite-enabled data and imagery analytics, for example, to help reduce the chemical usage of farming. Started in 2016, they are already in the commercial scale-up phase with more than 60 employees in 10 different countries. They are in their Series B funding and raised $20 million so far, and they should reach break-even next year. So this is a very impactful and successful company too. We'll prepare a list of do's and don'ts on the topics of raising funding, finding product market fit, expanding your company globally, and pivoting from B2C to B2B. If these topics resonate with you, you won't be disappointed. One small comment before we dig into this episode. This podcast is like a masterclass with long episodes where we talk in detail about the challenges and learnings of every guest. But if your time is limited and you still want to get advice about growing your business and having a greater positive impact on this planet, I've just created a best of series with a special format. 10 audio episodes between 3 to 10 minutes, shorter than a coffee break. They are only hands-on advice shared by the guests of this podcast. You can receive these best of episodes by signing up for my newsletter, in which I also send a text summary of the do's and don'ts shared by each guest after every episode. So if you want to get these condensed and useful tips for and from successful entrepreneurs with a sustainable mission, just go to my website, gtimpact.com, or find the link in the description of this episode and sign up for the newsletter. Well, thank you very much for being here with us today. How are you? Well, thank you for having me. I'm well. I'm at our London headquarters, and it's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you very much for your time. I've tried to describe your company a little bit, but can you tell us a few words about your company, what you do, and especially what's your mission? Sure. Well, you described it well. Uh, Hummingbird is a 
artificial intelligence and remote sensing platform for the food and agricultural industry. And what that means is that we, we measure food supply chains from space. And we have a particular interest in using data science and the best of deep learning to try to measure sustainability within that food supply chain. Our mission is fairly simple. We're trying to help feed a massive growing planet without destroying the environment. And we are the data science engine that drives that. That's a fantastic mission and a big one. But let's talk just uh, briefly about the stage at which you are right now. Can you tell me how many employees you have exactly? So Hummingbird is now five years old. We have 55 employees, mostly based in London and mostly data scientists and engineers. We have teams in Brazil, Australia, North America, and Ukraine. And those represent our core markets. We've raised just under 20 million US dollars. Um, and we would be considered probably a Series B business. Um, so very much in, in scale up and expansion mode. Back in 2016, how did you come up with that idea? Have you started the company alone? What are basically the first steps between the idea and uh, the incorporation of the company? I'm passionate about the environment and I grew up in a household that valued sort of plant pathology and uh, sort of climate change positive outcomes um, and also food. So Hummingbird was was really a kind of merger of lots of things that I grew up around. My background before starting the business was was in technology investment. And when I used to co-manage a, a hedge fund, I spent a lot of time investigating artificial intelligence, as it was known, it was a pioneering and much earlier field than it is today. And when I was looking into that space, looking at satellites, drones, some of the hardware that was enabling kind of some of these uh, sort of data science modeling exercises, that, that's when the idea for Hummingbird um, began to resonate. And the more I investigated the pain points around food production, food waste, the overusage of chemicals in the food supply chain, the more the idea took off. So I began the business at Imperial College, which is a, a science university in London, in the laboratory there, and, and we went from there. What were you doing at that time at Imperial College? Did you start that like full-time working uh, on the idea, or were you actually doing something else? Or? I just finished my MBA at INSEAD, um, which is a university outside Paris in Fontainebleau. And Imperial College was a very good place to start the business because um, on campus you have some of the best data scientists in London. And the, the university, it, it, think of it like, a, like an incubator. They liked the idea and for a very low cost, I think probably free, they gave me some space and it was an amazing place to raise the seed round and develop the business plan and hire my first team. So is this how you, you proceeded at that time then to fund the first six months when you start to work on the ID full time at Imperial College? You raised some funding from some angel investors and, and start paying yourself with that to be able to hire the first employees? The first six to eight months was self-funded, but really our costs were zero. I mean, we bootstrapped everything and... I think uh, prior to raising our first sort of pre-seed round, you know, we sort of kept the, the overall cost was, was sort of 10, 20,000 and below. We scraped everything to the bone and borrowed and hacked, you know, our first deck and prototype together and went from there. And how many were you during these first months? So in, in, in the first year, we went from one myself to to about six or seven and in the beginning the 
the kind of central founding team was engaged in developing the the sort of algorithmic, the basic algorithmic code that would allow us to make the same observations about a plant from a drone as we could with the human eye. So we were replicating that human eye to machine um, observation. So you know, if one plant was yellow, the other one was green, if one was higher than the other, if one had disease or not, we were trying to cross-reference human sight with um, analytics from a sensor on a drone. And that team kind of you know, was a very tight unit, and we had some help from various data science professors. And based on that success, we then raised our seed round. Just talking about the AI here, are we talking about machine learning? How? What kind of system is that? Where did you find the inputs to basically tell them this is a plan that is sick or not sick, for example? So Hummingbird uses a variety of sophisticated analytical methods. Um, deep learning or machine learning like, would represent two of those techniques. A lot of people talk about deep learning. Very few people are engaged in it. And we use it to do all sorts of complex modeling at scale. So for example, Hummingbird today is able to identify different crops in different fields from space. And we look at very large areas like Brazil and Canada and can pinpoint exactly what is in what field at any given time or whether forest has been cut down to make that field. And we do this by amassing an enormous training set of data, which is labeled or classified in the way that we want it. And that represents our input. Our output is that same classification at vast scale. So we're looking at billions and billions of pixels of imagery. And we're able to segment that in the way that we want it. All of what I've described would not be possible you know, based on human manual tasks. It's too much data. Um, and the accuracy needs to be too high for that human error. Where do these input data come from? Where do you find them? We, we do everything we can to find the data. Some of it comes from uh, public data sets. Some of it comes from customers and others, other parts of data we have to label ourselves. Just to give you an example, we, we hand-labeled 105 million lettuces over the last three years. Million? Yeah. A lettuce, is a, as you know, is a plant you buy in the supermarket for your salad. And we didn't just label the lettuces, we measured the diameter of every lettuce the, the, the way that it grows, and the color and texture of the plant. So you classify each and every plant with multiple features, and you can use that to develop you know, a set of algorithms that will monitor and track how it grows, how much nutrients or water it needs, when it's ready for harvest, and so forth. That's a huge work. So like in, in really here you had 105 million lettuces manually described or you can automat you can build an algorithm to actually manually label as well. I thought you had like hired a student to just do that and it was like okay, yeah, poor guy. We do have a team of people at all times labeling. So and they do a lot. Um depending on what you you know, if it's spotting wheat fields over France from satellite imagery, you can do maybe 200 a day. If it's counting potato plants in a field, you may be able to do 100 an hour. So it slightly de depends on what you're doing, but um, you know, very quickly you accumulate the right data set for the job. I mean, that's the kind of technology I wish I also had like 16 years ago when I've done my PhD, I remember taking microscope pictures and to calculate the dispersion of particles, just manually circling the, the amount of fillers we had on the picture to just calculate how like the percentage of uh, dispersion 
right now, uh, like AI is probably helping a lot for these kind of things. So now we know how you started. Thank you for describing a bit more how your, your technology works. Let's talk a bit about the, the do's and don'ts you send me. There are in three categories. They are, at least in my opinion, very, very helpful. So happy to discuss them now. The first one you sent me was, do raise more money than you need. Can you iterate on that? On the raising more capital point, I think the pandemic last year was a pretty good example of something unexpected where every single founder you know, in the universe must have thought to themselves, oh, I wish I had a little bit more capital, either to shore up your balance sheet or to take advantage of the, the, the market turmoil. Whichever way you sat macroeconomics-wise in terms of businesses that were resilient and businesses that weren't, you, you always hear of this advice, but it is true. I think even the best companies you know, are better off with 18 months of cash in the bank than two or three months of runway. And you know, fundraising is a distraction. H having said that, you don't want to raise so much money that you dilute yourselves, but on balance, probably be more conservative than, than not. Do you have an advice of how you estimate actually what is the right amount to raise? So you hear that many people aim for, let's say, 18 to 24 months of, of burn. Now, and more important than your total capital amounts raised is figuring out your business plan. You need to try and assess how much money you need to really win. And then you work backwards and you build in a bit of a cushion. But generally speaking, 18 to 24 months is, is a good time horizon. In the US, people are a little bit like more bullish in Europe, they're a bit more conservative. But there's no point raising, you know, four to five months of burn because by the time you raise it, you'll be out raising again. You added here, do raise more money than you need, but don't take anyone's money, especially if these are terms attached you wouldn't be comfortable with when your chips are down. So I think it's important this is almost hypocritical, this point, because it undermines my last point. But I think raise more money than you need. But I think you need one important filter, which is don't take anyone's money because the right strategic investor will really help you to accelerate your journey and the wrong ones will hold you back. So I think taking capital just because it's capital is not necessarily like a harmful dynamic, but it's also not going to help you. We've always done well at Hummingbird to attract really strategic money. So technology or food and agricultural money. And that has helped us with commercial validation. Um, you know, there are lots of stories around aggressive term sheets and what can happen, but it's likely that you will go through some highs as well as some lows. And when you're in those lows, just remember that the term sheet and that low moment can be quite a toxic mix and you have to be very cautious. You said you want to attract, you managed to attract the right strategic investors. What are the tips for you to, you know, recognize or to evaluate which investor is the right one for you? So I guess... All startups have, you know, a desired vertical that they're aiming to disrupt or change or impact or, or serve. And for us, it was very simple. You know, we, we tried to blend different stakeholder positions into one. So like, we actually approached some of our biggest target customers and raised some of the money off, that, off them. This was really important for the validation you know, for the minimal viable product and, and so forth. Because we were a technology company, we also went to people like Sir James Dyson and the European Space Agency. And we had some early support from people that were real technology leaders or thought vision, visionary thought pioneers in the space. And I think that gave everyone even more confidence that 
Uh, remote sensing and AI within food and agriculture was a very healthy space to be in long term and had enormous potential. Um, so it's about confidence, it's about support, it's about momentum, it's about commercial validation. But also those investors have you know, a vision that is worth listening to. The most difficult is to get the right support at the beginning and then if you start well, then it's easier, let's say, or it makes the job easier after. But if you go back to your, your shoes, when you start to look for the first investors, these like uh, very important ones for you, where did you find them? Was it just pure like introduction through network? Did you just Google them? Did you went to a lot of conferences or pitched the other company? We did a real combination of, of those things. Um, being at the Imperial College incubator was a, was a great central junction for startups. So there were investor angel evenings, which you could take part of. That's, that's a recommended route. We pitched the business to as many people as possible. I would do endless dress rehearsals with friends who worked in finance or technology, took as much feedback as possible, changed it, sent the deck to as many people. It, it then gathered a bit of momentum itself. We took part in as many like open angel pitching competitions as possible. We went after grants and we bootstrapped. So You know, I, I wish I could say that there's a, a silver bullet. For us, there wasn't. We just did as much as we possibly could across the board. So talking about the next do's you sent me, uh, you said do solve a pain point by aiming for the juggler. What I meant by that comment was many startups find a pain point that's enormous, that's impactful, And quite frankly, that, that the world needs. I think it's important at that junction to keep it simple and just go for it directly. You'd be surprised how many startups I see. We have a technology platform to solve climate change. And then people go off in a tangent. I think you really need to roll your sleeves up once you've found that pain point. And go for the eye of the storm, where there's the most impact, where you have the best product market opportunity, and to try and do things in the most direct way possible. If you apply that to Hummingbird, what did it mean for you? I think with Hummingbird, we've, we've made lots of mistakes. We've also achieved a lot. One of the challenges that our business has is that it's remote sensing, it's software analytics, AI, it's within a very large space, you can choose huge amounts of things to focus on. Do I look at disease detection from satellites? Do we try and predict performance? Do we try and reduce chemical usage or food waste or all of those things? It's about assessing which, you can't, you can't do everything on day one, right? So which of those, those items that I mentioned you know, has the biggest impact for the problem that we're trying to solve? And wh where's the best market opportunity? What's the, where's the low hanging fruit that no one else has done that's also valuable? And, and you've got to be very systematic about how you approach that, because the only way to get good at anything is by focus. And you have to sequence your order. Um, and these are you know, hard product development lessons that You know, you learn, you learn in real time as a founder, but you know, often you learn them by making mistakes, right? <laughs> and when you said you have to be very systematic, what is your approach? And side questions, how did you get your first customers? Because I guess that's also how you managed to identify what were the pain points that you, you were going to focus on. How did you find these first customers? So we... I think a key element to everything I mentioned is user research. You, know, you can't just be a um, kind of McKinsey consultant, you know, weighing up all the total addressable markets and without actually talking to customers. But for us, it was it's not quite as simple as ranking those. And in the early days, we did you know, a fair amount of work with customers, for example, around disease detection. So 
looking at individual plants with remote sensing to assess early infection. Now, the symptoms of this disease was not visible to the human eye. Whilst we found an immensely valuable kind of segment, one of the hard lessons we learned was the equipment that you need to measure disease from satellites and so forth is so expensive that even though it solves a big problem, the, the customer economics or the, the unit economics for our customers is probably not quite there. You're constantly weighing up all of these different forces. And when you're in your early days, like it's about experimenting and testing that with customers and continuously iterating. And this, this links with my comment earlier around shareholders also being customers. Now, if you're engaged with a captive audience, you have a higher chance of, of getting that iterative feedback. I think that's a key point here. Just to make sure I understand, your customers were actually not paying customers, but they were shareholders, basically. That's also how you get them. It wasn't like a pilot paid project. It was an exchange of being shareholders. You work with them to develop the technology that could be useful for them after. We've always had paying customers. Okay. At the very beginning, we've always had a handful of customers who were also shareholders. They paid us as customers, but they were invested in the journey as well. So they were experimenting themselves. How does digitalization and technology adoption you know, within our farming businesses work? Uh, we're a food company. We're trying to digitalize our supply chain. Hummingbird is also a company we've invested in. You know, we, we were all engaged in multiple like, exercises at, at once, the customer relationship being just one dynamic. And what we found was that for your incredibly early customers, you know, it's important to have some of that breathing space because you will make mistakes, you know, you will, you know, build the wrong product to begin with or build a product that's, you know, gets most of the way there, but yeah, you, know, you need a bit of help as well. What was the hardest part about this very first journey with the customers? I think that uh, a, a number of items w were difficult in the early years. With Hummingbird, The, the technology stack itself is, is fairly advanced. I don't want to say complicated because that's generally a negative. It's advanced because you have bioinformatics, remote sensing, machine learning, plant pathology, precision agronomy, image processing, all wrapped up in the same software architecture. So there's a lot of science under the hood. And... Getting that right requires money and patience, the right team and time. So the challenge for us, particularly in those early years, but to some extent now, is really around the technical execution. We are trying to alleviate negative climate change in food and agriculture. It's not selling umbrellas through an e-commerce platform. So technical execution, the right team, patience, the right product market fit. And these are all classic kind of internal pain points we, we navigate. Let's talk about the second uh, do you send me about this was don't just chase after the easiest or most opportunistic short-term revenue opportunity. So Hummingbird has always had customers and to a greater or lesser extent many of our customers are using remote sensing imagery and analytics for properly not for the first time but like they're embedding it within their organizations for for the first time and this you know naturally leads to customization and feature requests and And you have to be quite careful that you're building something for the industry and not just for one customer. As a founder that does investment rounds, you know that you're judged on short-term revenue performance. So there is also a temptation to 
chase after commercial contracts at all costs because that itself is the momentum that you need to do the round. It's a delicate balance because, you know, you can't just go into a lab and spend five years building something for no audience. It's a round balance. That, that, that was my main point. I drifted you away from the last questions, actually, when, when I wanted to ask you about your processes when you said you have to have a systematic approach for product development. So is that part of how you evaluate how much a feature is needed by that particular person versus or company versus the whole industry? How do you do that? The, the systematic approach to, to product development should filter out things that are distracting versus things that are valuable. You do have to have faith in that process. And you also have to have conviction that you know, what you're doing will come right. And it's, you know, sometimes it's the hardest thing is saying no, right? So you, know, you, have, to, you have to believe in what you're doing and believe in the fundamentals. What's the step that allows you to, to filter that? Is that a person, is that a product manager who decides, who knows the, you know, the industry enough to say, well, no, we're not going to like, develop that? Or how do you judge that? In an ideal world, this comes from your product team, right? So you know, as a founder, you have your mission. And if you work extremely closely with product leadership to carve out You know, your one, three, five-year vision and everything like your roadmap and so forth flows backwards from this. As part of that process, a huge amount of work should go into kind of user testing and research, like commercial validation, you know, assessing the kind of the technical execution and, and so forth. I think there are some things that happen in that process that, that are unforeseen. And you know, we've often gone down the path of something we felt is valuable and realized that it's you know, too expensive, or maybe the market's a tiny bit smaller than we realized. And obviously, we've never, we haven't mentioned today competition. And within the agri-food tech sector, Hummingbird has been around for five years. We've raised $20 million. dollars. But what happens if someone raises $100 and then does something in six months that you were planning. So it has to be fluid. You have to stay on your toes. And it's a constant assessment process that so you can't you know, fixate yourself on a target without looking around you because, you know, maybe the goalposts will move. Talking about the do you sent me on that product market fit, you said do follow your heart on an early pivot even if it's not what you set out to do. I think you explained that you went from a you know, B2C to B2B, so from a high resolution to a low resolution pivot. Can you explain me a bit more about this? So you read these legendary stories about pivots and Shopify starting as one thing and becoming another, or <laughs> Apple in the early days. I mean, the Silicon Valley is full of them. I think Hummingbird hasn't undergone as big as, well, as seismic a, a pivot as that. But we've also changed a lot as well. We started as a kind of drones for farmers type business. So we were a B2C, almost like a consumer SaaS offering that was using drones and sensors to try and help farmers in their individual fields. And we realized that wasn't scalable, like for a number of reasons. Firstly, the cost of having pilots and hardware. I mean, we're a software company. We had to use that. Just didn't just didn't make it as attractive as the other economics out there. And then secondly, we felt it was quite fragmented. You're a very different type of business. It's very sort of app-based, B2C type business. And we realized that if we wanted to have the most amount of impact. So how do we really disrupt food supply chains, not individual fields? How do we solve really enormous problems? We have to do that for businesses themselves. So within our sector, you have giants like Nestle and McDonald's and John Deere and Bayer and Monsanto and, and so forth. And really our target is to solve 
enormous problems for them and through them access thousands and thousands of individual farming users. Because as, as a sales channel and as a distribution channel, that is the most efficient way for, for Hummingbird's solution to reach the overall market, which is ultimately farms and hectares and acres and crops. So that represented a, a quite large customer pivot for us. But it was also a technology pivot because we went from drones that could look at fields to satellites that could look at a food supply chain across a continent. Stupid question, but satellites, how do you access satellites? It's a great, it's a great question. We uh, use the NASA and European Space Agency uh, open source constellations, Sentinel, Landsat, there are a number of satellites with different cameras on that we, that we use. And then we pay for some ourselves as well. There are now private satellites that have been launched and you can access, you pay per download or for an area of interest. Like the ones that like Musk was planning to launch, for example? Exactly. Airbus, Digital Globe, Planet Labs are just a couple. But if I was as clever and as had as much Bitcoin as Elon Musk, I'd probably have a plan to um, launch my own satellite. Because, because as a vertically integrated solution, that's possibly the perfect business model. Who knows? We're not quite there yet. I wish you to be on that level in a couple of years. T talking about impacts, actually, I'm sure you have some measurement uh, of you know the impact you are having on the sustainability one of the obvious one i mentioned in the introduction is you can help these big farming industry to just reduce the amount of chemical usage but do you have numbers or an estimation of how big the, your impact is right now so in numbers we serve let's say 100 plus enterprise customers so really massive food and farming businesses. So like John Deere, the tractor company. Don't confuse that with farmers themselves. We serve hundreds of big customers. We have analyzed trillions of pixels of, of, of data um, across, let's say, 50 to 100 million hectares of, of farmland. It's a very big area. And across that land, on any given you know, pixel by pixel grid or field or farm, we would like to think that we can save 20 to 30% of chemical inputs. So using our imagery and our maps to help farmers or farming businesses see problems and then use less chemicals. So that's a massive metric for us. And we would consider ourselves, therefore, to have reduced the environmental impact of that farming by tens and tens of thousands of tons of carbon dioxide not being emitted. Where it gets, in my view, very cool and very advanced is trying to understand that various regenerative agricultural practices can actually put carbon back into the soil as well. So what Hummingbird does is it uses satellite imagery to measure the environmentally positive impact of farming. So our mission is to really help people not just emit less carbon dioxide, it's actually to replenish the soil with more carbon itself. You were actually going to a point that I wanted to, to discuss. I don't have a lot of knowledge about this, but you know I heard about these regenerative agriculture and hybrid agriculture where actually you don't have any more chemicals used in it. What's your vision of that? Can we go on with like industrial farming the way we go? Is that something you have an opinion on? How it's going to be in 10 years time, how it should shift or how it will shift? It's a very hard, hard question. We cannot continue the way that we are. If we continue to mass produce food with the same environmental impact as we do today, if we continue to waste food, 
if we continue to overuse chemicals, the the goodness of our soils will disappear and you know we will accelerate climate change to a point in which we cannot return back from. Having said all of that, it's also incredibly hard to feed a projected 10 billion human beings without using the best of seed technology, chemical inputs, biochemistry, and, and so forth. It's about a balance, and you cannot adopt a binary position and say all chemicals are bad in the same way that you can't adopt a position and say organic food can feed the world because lots of people can't afford it. So it's truly about a balance. And <coughs> Hummingbird's technology is designed to tip that balance into a more regenerative or a more sustainable position. Thank you. We talk about funding, product market fit. Let's talk about your international expansion. You've done a couple of like good and bad decisions. And the first advice you told me was like, don't ignore the US early on if it's your best market just because it's hard or expensive. I feel as though European founders can be very European centric. And your natural inc inclination is to think, oh, well, I have a business in France, maybe it'll work in Germany. And there's lots of, there's lots of rationale to that. I feel as though for many industries, including food and agriculture, the US is, that's the big market. And it's also our, our fastest growing market. So one thing we learned was probably go there earlier. But it is also expensive, and you hear all sorts of horror stories about companies that have got it wrong in the U.S., and I think it's held to a, a sort of scary position for many, many founders. I think my point is really around if it's your best market, it's your best market. Don't ignore that fact. Um, anecdotally, From our experience, we spread ourselves quite thin early on in complicated markets to enter, like Brazil and Russia and so forth. Now, these might be the best and biggest geographies for food production, but they're also complicated markets to enter. It's about balance. Um, and, you know, probably with the resources that you have available, you know, not not biting off more than you can handle uh, too early. Again, how do you know that? How do you try to know how much you can spread yourself? I think that if your product's not working in one market, it's not going to work in two either. And <laughs> someone once said to me, like, it's very easy to find you know, a handful of fools in any country or market to buy your product. And I guess the temptation is... To, to go looking for fools <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying that that's what we did but how do you tell how can you keep that discipline I think there will be a threshold of success within your home market that you should set your sights on and that threshold should tell you whether you're ready or not there's a great business the other day I found it's livestock tech so tech for cows and and stuff and uh they became very dominant in Australia I think they had a thousand customers before they moved to, to the US and as a result they really understood their market and their customers and their product it was very developed it's easy for hummingbird within the UK to correct mistakes because you're never further than a few hours drive away from a customer. It's less easy overseas and it's just an important kind of consideration. So make your product work first in one market before you try to expand, have some threshold like success criteria that you hold yourself before you decide to, to move on. What were some of the bad decisions you made in How would you do that differently now? Everyone makes bad decisions. Uh, it's, I think it's about recognizing which ones you've made that are bad and learning. I think 
look, it's incredibly rare to, um, you know, to magic formula up the best team in the world. And, you know, your, your founding team is very often not your Series B team and your Series A team is very often not your Series C team. Having the right team mix, motivating people in the right way, having the right culture, having people that can grow with the business, having people that are hungry and ambitious and experienced. You know, there's, there's books worth of lessons to be learned in that objective alone. And I imagine that I'm not alone in, in saying that you know, many of your mistakes are down to kind of, you know, team and hiring and, and so forth. Um, I think you can, you can only live and learn from, from those mistakes, but you know, these tend to be very big mistakes when you make them as well. For example, how has your team changed from the beginning to, to now? Well, in, in absolute terms, right? You go from being one person to 55 people or one person to 60 people. So it's a full change many times over that itself represents a lot of change right and also bear in mind that there were certain junctions where hummingbird went from let's say six people to 15 and then we went from 20 to 40 you go through these moments these cycles of 100 change so you're, you're bound to make some mistakes you're bound to you know need recruiters and hiring managers and all i can say is check your references always ask for references always take your time never you know try and hire one position and find one candidate and go for that person i think you know just try to ensure that you're running a, a real process that will mitigate mistakes Always ask for references. That's a good one. There is a book called Do Scale Up that I, I read a year and a half, two years ago. I will also put the link in the resources. It also explains very well how the founding team and the people leading the company, how different it can be and the strengths of entrepreneurs at the beginning, being able to be really like flexible and, and reactive to a very fastly changing environment is a strength at the beginning but when you do need to scale up sometimes these strengths become something that you have to be able to change as an entrepreneur and founder and that sometimes actually people can't for example as well uh, uh, Josefson from Epishine also explained that he developed Epishine until a certain level as a CEO and then decided to step down to actually uh, hire someone else to be the CEO of the company what's your experience on that side yourself as an entrepreneur It's not something I'm ready to do, is the short answer, or, or want to do. I still have the energy and, and the passion, and quite frankly, you've invested so much in something that it's about timing. Having said that, I think you know, at some point, exit is, is a massive consideration. Whether that's a transition or whether you exit the business completely, You know, there are all sorts of junctions in the future. Hummingbird is, is still too small for that. If we were worth hundreds and hundreds of millions or a billion dollars and we were looking at an exit, it's likely that you know, you've already undergone some kind of uh, founder transition. But, but one way to answer your question is, and this is, this is key for hiring in general, is am I still growing with the business? Have I hired someone that can grow with the business? Because your head of engineering at seed round may not be good enough to be head of engineering at series C, or maybe your head of marketing is too entrepreneurial. It's like too much of a hustler. And when the business gets bigger and more professionalized, then maybe they don't make that transition away from a kind of hustle startup. So, It's all about finding people that can kind of grow with your scale. Um, and, you know, it's getting that right cultural mix and that right energy and, and, and so forth. It's not that easy. 
what were some of the toughest decisions you had to take regarding growing your team and changing people positions, for example? How did you approach that when you had someone, especially if it's someone, a co-founder, I can imagine that's a co-founder who was really good at marketing at the beginning. And then you realize, oh, actually it doesn't work on the scale-up phase right now, for example. I think what becomes, well, what begins as a hard decision, you get used to having to make difficult decisions, letting people go and you know, not promoting someone on, or transitioning them from a role to another role. But you soon learn that those are just the necessary parts of, of running a big team. Um, it's very difficult to see into the future and, and kind of preempt a hiring need. But I, you know, I think ex extremely good founders that I admire, you know, can somehow always see around the corner. I also think that one of the big challenges you know, for anyone that's listening, that's raising a seed round is kind of like, well, you know, do I have a data scientist or do I have an engineer or do I have a front end or a back end? It's about kind of finding that right cultural mix. But I guess if you're technical and you're not commercial or you're commercial and you're not technical, you have a difficult set of decisions in the very early days around you know, team makeup. It's not easy. If you take the five first positions, you hired as a co-founder, basically the core team of five people. What were these five people background of like roles so interestingly we we only hired data scientists in the beginning and because we're a data science company at our core and we did not want to build an app or a stack and then worry about the data science so this is what i meant about solving something at the jugular we valued the data science above everything else and we figured out that You know, a few lines of Python code to represent an algorithm that we developed as a data science team was enough of a technical validation. And so that was the priority. What we then did was built a software engineering team around those data scientists. And that's when CTO, front end, back end, data engineers kind of all, all joined. We wanted to kind of have a creative environment that wasn't held back by, you know, the modus operandi of the software stack. Um, and, and we went from there. I wanted to ask you, what's your background again? Because you've done an MBA, but you are studied English literature. So you are not a technical person from the education side. When you have to hire these very technical and key person for your company, what's your advice to judge their technical abilities? It's a great challenge, what you've mentioned. And so my own background encompassed technology investment to a fairly sophisticated level, but not down to the code base. So, you know, to this day, I, I wouldn't be able to give someone a a technical test and assess it and benchmark it against, you know, other engineers and, and so forth. So getting your CTO or your lead data science hires are absolutely paramount because ultimately you're trusting their technology judgment as to the capabilities of those people. This is a fairly common founder challenge and very quickly you'll be out of your depth in some way um so it's about trusting the people that you've got this is why references are so important but you really have to get your your sleeves rolled up with your domain i must have read over a thousand academic articles or phd papers in our subject matter by the time i started interviewing the team so I had a fairly well-trodden knowledge of our field. Certainly from an academic perspective, that gave me the ability to kind of engage you know, with it properly. Um, it's also complex science. It was an important le like learning piece for me before starting Hummingbird. 
so dive into it yourself as well so that you are able to judge and I thought so that's I guess the I don't see the chance you had but the the way you set up the company by starting at the Imperial College and having this project with the data science is the first lead persons who worked with you you had basically the chance to to just test them in your project directly and then you you were I guess not only say lucky enough to have the the right persons from the very beginning on and know you could trust them that's true and there's one other advantage which is that because hummingbird is made up of so many different scientific disciplines very few people are experts in all of them so even as a generalist you're reading a lot around your subject you very quickly become the expert in your business so i wouldn't say that founders have to be technical or commercial or even you know qualified academics or or industry veterans in their field but you do have to become the expert in your business from day one um and that will shine through Thank you very much for all these advice. Uh, they are very very useful. I'd like to finish with uh, the the usual questions uh, that I ask all my guests. The first one is what is the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? The the best advice I've ever been given was by one of the founders of Spotify who actually came into the, to the office as an investor and Really, it was advice around team, and they said to me something that stayed with me, which is, you know, always hire people that can grow with the business and that can press the reset button. And when you raise your Series A or when you raise your Series B, be surrounded by people culturally that can set a new pace and direction, that can grow themselves, that have the energy to metamorphose you know it's a metamorphosis into the next best version of themselves and be able to recognize that as a founder and if you if you can get that right you're going to you know blitz scale but if you don't get that right you're going to be carrying dead weight or you're not going to have the right team and it's it's a small kind of human bit of advice but I think it really resonates today. Thank you. I guess one of the way to see that would be you can recognize these people by being hungry learners. Do you have another like a uh, way to recognize these kind of people? No. There's no oh, magic no. formula. <laughs> But look, you you have to have people that you're aligned with culturally you have to be able to trust those people communication across the team is vital and you know, if you're a technology business you know, you've got to ensure that you've got the right skills like or the right skills mix and you know any any missing ingredient of what i've mentioned is not fatal but if you're missing you know, two bits of ingredients then it then it probably is It, it's about the rigor and the process of that and it's about patience and you, know, you don't want to rush into it because if you if you scale up a C team it's very hard to change once once it's big so your C team will never become an A team probably might become a B team but you know once once you're up and running then it's a it's a much harder job to do Which book would you recommend entrepreneurs like you to read or which book have you read that you know has really influenced you? I think when I was at business school the lean startup had come out and was taking the world by storm and it still impacts kind of decisions that I make all the time and is very good. I love Reid Hoffman's Masters of Scale podcast, one of the best sort of audio books or equivalents you could possibly ever engage with I, i i think just for the most part biographies can be the most inspiring as you know as well it's like real life stories i, I read many but um I, i do like podcasts as well as books and, and i think lean startup and masters of scale are 
are good places to start. Thank you for Masters of Scale. I will put the link. Uh, I'm definitely going to check it out. Could you tell us one thing about you that I wouldn't be able to find out online? I'm a beekeeper. You're a beekeeper? Yes. How oh, fantastic. Where? In London? No, in, uh, in the countryside. But I've been a fan of it for many years. And I've been looking for a, a way in which to keep bees in London. The challenge is finding roof space that is sheltered. Um, but actually, inner city honey is high quality because of the, the variety of the flower and fauna. I've custom built and had made several hives before. And some of them are, are called freedom hives where you don't actually have to interfere with the bees at all. You just let just let nature take its course. Um, but they fascinate me and probably a boring, random fact online that no one's ever heard before. That's a very, very cool, fun fact. <laughs> Thank you for that. This is your time before we leave to just share any message you want with, with our audience. Are you looking to attract more talent? Are you raising, like looking for more investors? Where can people find you? How should they contact you? This is your time. It's been a great pleasure to have taken part today. And look, we're not raising money right now. We will be at the end of the year. So keep following our stories and our social media handles. We're pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can connect to me personally on LinkedIn, Will Wells Hummingbird, for anything that's, that's business related. And just as consumers and people that buy food, just keep the conversation going and keep questioning where your food came from, how it was produced, because it's really consumers that drive big brands like Diageo and Nestle and PepsiCo to, to themselves push out sustainability in their own supply chains. So keep being curious and asking those important questions And you never know, you know, it may fulfill the third agricultural revolution prophecy that we all hope. And then finally, you know, we are hiring. We're looking for people in data science and software engineering that are kind of inspired by our journey and the impact. So look at our jobs section of, of the website, which is hummingbirdtech.com. I will add all the links in the resources of the episodes as well. Will, thanks very much for all your advice today. I wish you a, a, a great journey and I wish you, you know, to be the next Elon Musk. I'm sure you are in a, in a really good way to have a super high impact on this world. So thank you very much for sharing your tips and uh, have a nice day. Fantastic. Well, thank you and hopefully uh, stay in touch and speak soon. If you like this podcast, there are two things you can do that would mean the world to me. The first thing is to sign up for the podcast newsletter. That way you will be notified of the new episodes, but you will also get a summary of the learnings at the end of every season. Plus for each episode, you will get the resources and the list of do's and don'ts that every guest shares with me. And finally, you will also get the opportunity to ask our future guests one question in advance. You can sign up for this newsletter on gtimpact.com. The second thing you can do to be super helpful is to recommend this podcast. For that, you can write a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with your friends, other entrepreneurs, and people trying to build a sustainable future. That way, we can all learn together and work on a brighter future for us, our children, and our planet. Thank you very much and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day.